university, God's been messing with me. I told, I told, I told um, as I pray with the tech team and the choir, uh, or tech team in the music department on Sunday mornings, on Sunday mornings, I had to share with them, I had to share with them that God's been messing with me. I had a plan that I was going to do a whole bunch of different things in this sermon, and God constricted me to a very narrow focus. Over the next few weeks, we're going to talk about prayer, and I think prayer is one of these things that we all have a conceptual framework of. It's a familiar word, but sometimes it's mysterious serious at the same time, and sometimes we have questions about it. So I will endeavor over the next few weeks to put together a series on prayer that A, A will answer some of your questions. You know, one of the beauties of the digital campus, digital campus is I, as I'm writing and preparing, I ask people to just go on it. If you're not part of a digital campus, just go on Facebook, look for um, University of Amy Z digital campus, apply to get in or team. Brother Tahina and Sister Lori will let you in. It's a private group, but on there, ask the question, do you have any questions about prayer? Any questions about prayer? If some of you are like, I'm not going to do the digital campus, just it just email me at, at pastoruniversityamez.com because we want to make sure that this series is effective and also answers some of your pressing questions. Amen? Amen. I want to just start with our verse for this morning. It's quite simple. It's found in the book of Matthew 6 chapter, 6 chapter. And it's the beginning of the Lord's Prayer. I felt like the Lord's Prayer was a good place to start, a good place to start. Because it was when Jesus' disciples asked him, asked him, um, how should we pray? And I think it's a good beginning framework. And then we will get into intercessory prayer, audacious prayer, some, um, some other things as the series evolves. So... The verse reads quite simply like this, Matthew 6, 9th chapter, Matthew 6, chapter 9th verse. Pray then like this, our Father in heaven. That's it. That's all we're going to work with this morning. Our Father in heaven. Let us pray. Father God, as we come to you to talk about your prayer, the Lord's prayer, May you remove Coloma, hide him behind the cross, hide him behind the cross. Give him the manifestation of your words and your wisdom to speak to the people of God in your holy name. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, uh, Sister Jan, um, I know you're watching, Sister Jan. Um, Yesterday, I realized that faith and prayer are not a foreign subject to our area, to the Palo Alto, Stanford, Mountain View area. I was on um, Zoom calls from very early in the morning, and I did not get a chance to watch the um, Stanford and Oregon game. But, you know, as my notifications on the different social media templates with different formats were coming through, I realized something happened. So I had to go, you know, watch some highlights, use the YouTube, use the XYZ, use the, the lives and see. And and what I realized, what I realized as, as they were kicking the field goal was that we got a stadium full of people to pray in a place where only 6% of the people go to church. So, so, it is obvious to me, as much as some people profess not to know what it is, they, they, they learned how to pray yesterday. <laughs> in, their need of, in their need of prayer. But seriously, as I started 
thinking about it, I realized as I looked at the thousands of people watching and, and, and knowing the prayers, anticipations, that I needed to really, as I started this series, define what makes the Christian prayer distinctive than a wish and a hope at a football game. I needed to really build a foundation to understand why prayer is so critical. You know, we don't pray in a wish and a hope, but we have a firm foundation that our life and our prayers are built on. There is a foundation that God gives us. The text from this morning is one of the more famous texts of the Bible. Even if you are not from a Judeo-Christian background, you have heard the Lord's Prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. You know the prayer. It is pretty common. It is one of the most known pieces of scriptures in the Bible. And what that scripture is formed from was the question of the disciples or Jesus teaching the disciples how to pray. You have to understand that prayer um, as an act in the Bible evolved later on. If you actually go back to the books of Genesis and Exodus, you'll notice that there's God speaking to the people, but there isn't like a prayer moment. There isn't like a prayer moment. And as you start seeing it, prayer is very distant because it becomes something that you do at the temple. So as we get to the time period that Jesus is in, this is a revolutionary kind of prayer because it switches from a far and distant God to a very personal one. And right now, I think that every believer needs to understand that that first line in the Lord's prayer is one of the most critical ones because it gives us the foundation. I want to just take my time today, take my time, and go through three words. Three words, only three words. Our Father in heaven. These three words can create the foundational understanding of the power of prayer. I don't think many believers understand the audacity of saying our. It's an adjective, it's a possessive, it's belonging to you. Now, I need I need to be clear. I need to be clear on why our is so is so powerful. When you say something is our, it doesn't belong to a group of things. It belongs to us. The God we serve is not a God among a group of gods. We, not, we can't just switch and pray to another God and another God and another God. We can't pray to this tree or that tree. We can't pray to this thing or that thing. We have determined by using the word our that we are monotheistic prayer. There is one God, and he is in direct relationship with our, he is our God, you know. I know, I know, I know, I know we live in, in politically correct times. I, I know we live in times of, of uh, where people want to make everybody feel good, but let me just break one critical thing down, one critical thing down. The Christian faith is not a universalist faith. It's not one that says we are all together. As believers, we believe there is one God in heaven, one God that created it all, one God that redeemed us, one God. So I can't go someplace, and I, I love my Buddhist brothers, I love my Muslim brothers, I love my Jewish brothers, and, but I will say, you know, I have one God. Can we be civil? Yes. Can I be kind? Yes. But I can't compromise. On our God. Because imagine this, imagine this. The second you compromise on our God, 
is the second you take the power of God and discard it. See, people, people don't understand how you plug into prayer. You need to have the posture and understanding that our God is not a God that is in a group or a pantheon of gods, but our God is the very creator of heaven and earth. Our God is the very one that did it all. Our God is the one that came and died on Calvary. Our God is the one for the past two thousand years that has moved in the human realm and touched us in different ways. We understand that our God is God and only God. Because when I prayed to God, I don't have a doubt of who I'm praying to. I don't have I might have doubts in my mind about my situation. I might have doubts in my mind about where I'm going. But I need you to understand, university, that you don't need to have any doubts that God is God. So many people take situational doubts and turn it into a doubt about God. And they wonder why the prayers are ineffective because they're not praying to God. They're praying to a lotto. Have doubt in your situation. I encourage you. I, like I preached last week, we ought to ask questions about our faith. We ought to be inquisitive. We ought to go to God and bring our doubts to him. But don't ever doubt God because he is our God. The next thing is Father. It's one thing to be possessive of God, but it's another thing to declare relation with God. You see, this is a very critical transition point, um, Deaconess. This is a very critical transition point. In my smallness and finite nature as a human being, my, my, it's easy for me to say there is a God. He's our God. Uh, my belief system and structure belongs to him. Uh, and I can do that. But what happens when I say my relationship is personal. There is a father and child relationship. And I understand uh, in our modern um, in our modern society, particularly in black community, where we've had challenges around black fatherhood, preaching this is a challenge because some people have no relationship with their father, so they're looking and saying, how do I have a relationship with God? And I struggled with this because, you know, it's, there's a few verses in the Bible that challenge me, you know, we're like, love your neighbor as you love yourself, and if you don't love yourself, how can you love your neighbor? How can you say God's your father and you have no relationship with your biological father or your relationship with your biological father is broken and fractured? And then I stand up here as a good pastor and say, God is your father. It's a disconnect. But then what I realized, what I realized is that I have to teach that the brokenness of human form is not the brokenness of God. His relation and his fatherhood to us is of a perfect kind. 
perfectly loving, perfectly embracing, perfectly encouraging, even in my midnight hours as I shed my tear and I feel a spirit comfort me. Is there anybody in the house that has had a battle in their life and they are fighting through a situation and no matter who you talk to, no matter what you do, you feel overwhelmed and defeated and then one night in your midnight hours, you all of a sudden you feel a sense of peace and calm. That is the father of God. Because even if my human father never called me, never paid child support, never did what he did, my heavenly father, no matter my position in relationship, still loved me enough to come in my midnight hours and hold me tight. So when I start praying, I'm not just praying to something high in the sky. I'm praying to my father in heaven that loves me perfectly. So I just need one or two people right now that are dealing with difficult situations that when you pray tonight I know God is going to keep you I know God's going to hold you I know God All human fathers have some deficit. It's all right. They're not God. But God doesn't have any deficits. Now, now, the other thing, the last thing is heaven. Last thing is heaven. Last thing is heaven. Now, heaven does three things, Jermaine. Heaven does three things. The first thing, the first thing that heaven does is it shows position, it shows power, and it shows promise. Think about it. So, Father, our, our shows our possessiveness of God. Father shows the relationship to God, but then heaven shows position, power, and promise. Now, I think one of the, 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 the single greatest deficits in modern Christianity is that we have um, detach the eschatological nature of our faith to a here and now theology. You want to break it down? We forget that we're playing for eternity and instead the church has focused on things of the here and now. My Bible, my Bible is very clear. God loves me. He cares for me. He never promised me a perfect life. He never promised me seven steps to figure it all out. But what he did promise me is paradise in heaven. And this is moving the focus of my prayer to the greater things and not limiting it to the small things. So many of so many people today, and, and I blame the church. I don't blame the people. I blame the church. Come to church to solve an issue that is currently going on or meet a need. But what God is telling you is that our faith is based in eternity, and heaven shows us this. So the first thing, the first thing is heaven shows the position of God. God is not walking on earth. He is not in Olympus. He's not, he's not around the corner. He's not, he is in the place where it all began and where it all finished. God's position is supreme. He is high and lifted up. He is the God above all things. So when I pray to God, I'm not praying to something that is a fairy in the sky. I'm not praying to a tree on the corner. I'm not praying to somebody that walked around. I am praying to the God on heaven, the God in heaven that created it all. And what we know is God's position. You know, one of the things I know, one of the things I have learned from my life, my life, one of the things I've learned in life is that I have a lot of people that want to help me, 
but many people aren't in the position to help me. There are a lot of things, you know, one of the things, and I shared this before, and I'll share this again. One, the most powerless job I've ever had is become a pastor. Because when, when you sit and you talk to people about their loved ones that have passed or their loved ones that are sick or the issues in relationships or the challenges, you, are absolute, you should absolutely be clear in your mind as a pastor, as a minister, as a ministry leader, as somebody in the church that I can't fix it. I wish I had the position to snap my fingers and fix every one of your issues. And the reality for many of us is that our family, doctors, there's so many different people that can't fix our situation. They want to. They really do. They care about you. They want to do it. But, but, but only God can do it. Only God can do it. You know, one of the critical things I, I learned, you know, be, you know, being new to fatherhood, um, we, we have a, a rambunctious two-year-old that seems to have no sense of danger. There is not an object that can be climbed on that he does not feel should be climbed. We take him to um, gym class, and the older kids will cry, and he will be the first one to go, Wee! But every once in a while, he will fall and scratch his knee, or he'll hurt his hand. And as much as I want to stop him crying, I can't. Because I don't have the right position. So God in heaven has the position to do it. He also has the power. Second point, power, power. Uh, I've met a lot of people. Uh, I've met a lot of people that have position but have no power. They have a title but can't do nothing for you. They have no control. They have nothing else. They just have a title. But God's position gives him power to impact you, power to shift situations, power to answer the deep requests of our hearts that nobody else knows. God has the power. How do I know God has the power? Because he created the very universe. He created the very stars. He created the earth. He figured out the right balance of oxygen and nitrogen and carbon dioxide in the sky, although we're messing that up, um, to allow us to breathe. He figured out how much moisture we needed in the sky to make it blue and so that the plants would have the right sunlight and that they would be able, um, through photosynthesis, to be green. He's figured all of the workings of heaven and earth out. He's changed and transformed things. And the other thing that I'm absolutely certain of is because I have a personal relationship, I have evidence in my life that the longer I live, there are situations that I should have paid consequences for, but God stepped in. There are situations that I didn't have the answer for, but God had the power to step in. I There were things that I was trying to figure out, I was trying to get the money for, but God stepped in. Is there anybody that has had a God experience where no matter what you had, no matter how you did it, no matter how you worked, you couldn't figure it out, but only the power on high that is Jesus Christ and God in heaven, that was the only power that could fix you. That was the only power that could change you. That was the only power that could impact your life. So many of us just need to be honest. I am not that smart. I am not that slick. I'm just been blessed by God.
you know what? Position's great. Power's great. When this is the key with heaven, it's a promise. Because you could have the position and you could have the power. But why would God intervene for us? Because everything before this point, everything before this point, it's us claiming God. It's us defining the relationship. But this thing that is heaven in this text shows the promise. When Jesus spoke to the thief on the cross, he made a promise. He says, this day I will see you in paradise. When God spoke to Abraham, he said, I will bless your generations. What God has promised us through from the very beginning of Genesis and from the life of Jesus Christ is fulfilled in the promise of heaven. That's why when we start this prayer and I said, oh, Father in heaven, or if you old school, who art in heaven? It is the promise that is fulfilled to every believer. It is the promise that his power is, he has decided to have relationship with you. He has left heaven. He has come in human form as Jesus Christ. He has walked on the earth. Then he died on a cross and he rose on the third day. He promised us that he would walk with me and he would talk with me and that he would be with me. So when I start thinking about my prayers, I start thinking about heaven. And I know that the God in heaven came to earth and he kept his promise. So heaven is not a distant place. It's not a fragment place. It is a place of promise for me as a believer. And sometimes when I have doubts, sometimes when I have issues, I just start thinking about the fact that my God is a promise keeper, that my God will keep his word, that my God is listening to me. So he has all power. He has all position. But most of all, he promised me that he would take care of me. So many of us are looking for guarantees in life. So many of us are looking for the next sure thing. But I know one thing that's for sure. It's the promises of God. How do I know the promises of God are real? Not because I read it in the Bible. Because I saw it in my grandmother's life. I saw it in my father's life. I've been pastoring long enough where people tap me on the shoulder and they tell me that God is still in the miracle working business. Some people in here have a testimony that would light you up. It's too personal to share, but somebody in here has a testimony that God has kept his promises to you. There were things and situations that had you defeated, but the promise of God to have a personal relationship with you through Jesus Christ and then be there to walk with you, that promise has been kept time and time again in your life. Somebody in here knows that when God said he would keep you, he would be a way maker, he would be a healer, he would be a confidant, he would walk, he would lift you up in your darkest hours. You know that God keeps his promise. So many of us skip through that first line of the Lord's Prayer. But I pray that as you start praying this week and you read the Lord's Prayer, 
you don't skip through that first part. You understand that our Father in heaven has such profound and deep implications that our Father in heaven is the foundation for all our prayers. Our Father in heaven is what gives Christian prayer a distinctive power and efficaciousness. You know, we live in a world where prayer has been cheap, cheapened. Uh, how do I know? Every time an incident happens, everybody says thoughts and prayers. But right now, as believers, we're dealing with the significant truth of believers in God praying and how that is absolutely based on this foundation of our Father in heaven. May we please stand.